Okay, like I said, good to be here tonight. Let's, uh, let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 tonight. 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1. Just had been uh, just a blessing preaching through 2 Thessalonians with the youth. Uh, it took us about, man, probably about two and a half, three years to get through 1 Thessalonians with them. And I don't preach every week. You know, it's usually every other or sometimes once a month. So it's not like we, you know, we preached every week to them. But, uh, but in 2 Thessalonians, just getting a blessing from this. And in chapter 1, we're going to just narrow, narrow in on, uh, kind of zone in on verses 6 through 8, but we got to read, uh, we're going to read verses 3 to 8, okay, verses number 3 to 8. It says here, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the time that we can have here together, Lord. And I just pray, Father, for your blessings on this. I pray, Lord, that this would just be profitable, Lord, and we can get something from this, Lord, that we can apply into our hearts and our lives, Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in uh, 2 Thessalonians, just some background here. In the book of Thessalonians in general, uh, Paul and Silas came to Thessalonica in the, in the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. And they actually had great spiritual success. Many uh, uh, Greeks or Gentile men and women were saved. They believed. However, the Jews of that city uh, moved with envy and basically attacked Paul, attacked the place where he stayed, attacked the people that... Uh, assaulted the house that took him in, and, and they end up sending Paul and Silas uh, to Berea to another place uh, in fear of the Jews. And they run to that place too in Berea, and then crazy enough, they're having success there too, and the Jews from Thessalonica hear about the success there, and they take the trip and follow Paul all the way over there too uh, to persecute them. And then eventually they just put Paul on a boat to Athens. Uh, but you can imagine the church in Thessalonica was a persecuted church. They had these kind of people around uh, in their city that hated Paul, hated his message. Obviously going to hate the Christians that believed them. You can imagine they were a persecuted uh, church. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul commended them because he says, uh, they received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Okay? So they received it in affliction, but it was with joy. Okay? Uh, now, we have yet, here as American Christians, we have yet to be afflicted uh, like, how, like they are where we're at. However, uh, often enough, we are still troubled by the enemies of Christ. Okay? A lot of enemies in this world, enemies of Christ, enemies of the church. And in 2 Timothy 3.12, it says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Okay, so there is something about it. That's something that we're called to as Christians. There is suffering. There's affliction that comes along with Christianity. In fact, if life, if your Christian life is just smooth sailing and there's no issues whatsoever, then, uh, then we're probably living too worldly, not godly. But if you're living godly, you're going to have some trouble. Okay, you're going to have some mocking, persecution, whatever the case may be, because that's just the world the way it is. But in verse number 6 through 8, verses 6 through 8, we see words like tribulation, mighty angels, flaming fire, vengeance. And then look at verse number 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. So I just want to look at this word recompense tonight, recompense. Recompense means to compensate. It means to compensate. It means to make an equivalent return, okay? And as we know, if you read the Bible and you've been here for a while, as we know, and we're going to see in a bit, there's going to be a time, there will be a time when God will recompense tribulation 
on those that trouble us, on those that obey not the gospel of God, okay, on his enemies. There will be a come a time when he will do that. But just a few things about recompense I see here. In verse number six, it says this, it is a righteous thing with God to recompense. Recompense, number one, is righteous. It's a righteous thing with God, okay? Righteous meaning it's just, it's merited, Okay, God expressed his love, right, in the person of Jesus Christ, right? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God gave his son, Jesus Christ, to die for the sins of the world. We know that. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He was made to be sin. That cup that he asked to be removed from him according to his father's will was that cup of sin. It was the cup of God's wrath poured in Jesus Christ, on Jesus Christ, on that cross. In fact, the book Isaiah the prophet writes this about him. He says his visage His countenance was so marred more than any man in his form, more than the sons of men. On that cross, he was unrecognizable. Okay, never mind all these paintings that people draw nice and stuff. No, no, he was unrecognizable. He became the epitome of sin on that cross. Not just unrecognizable because of the beatings, not just because of the thorns, not just because of uh, of nails in his hands and his feet, and aside being pierced, but because he was made to be sin. He was made to be sin. That's why he's unrecognizable. Made to be sin. After three hours of darkness, okay, not an eclipse, okay, three hours of darkness because of that sin, he gave up his life and went to hell for us. Okay, and we're getting somewhere. I know, you, I know most of you know this stuff, but he went to hell for us, okay? And three days and three nights, when death thought that it had victory, when death thought it, he won, Jesus Christ rises victorious from death, rises in victory. And the reason that we're kind of elaborating on his death, burial, and resurrection is because, well, number one, we should never get over it, okay? There's something we should never get over. But it's also to remind us that recompensing tribulation on those who do not obey the gospel of Christ is a righteous thing with God. He's merited. He's justified to do so. It's just. It's merited. He has done all the work. He's paid the high price, and he's offered the gift of salvation to anyone who wants to receive it. Give it to him freely. It costs him so much. And yet all salvation is not a, we know that heaven is not a reward. It's a gift. I can only take it. I can only take it. He already paid for it. He's done all the work. But in John 3.36, it says this, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. God's wrath abides on the unbeliever. And God is righteous and just to recompense tribulation to those that trouble us. You know the biggest complaint about God or the most ignorant a complaint about God that I get from talking with people is that is that God is is so mean. How could a how could a loving God send people to hell? You know, man, wow, he's he's so mean and and he does this and he does that. And it's such a it's such an ignorant uh, uh, comment. And you're really ignorant of what Christ did. To even make a statement like that that God is mean and 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 he's just all about death and war and everything going on in this world. Man, just an ignorant statement to make if you look at Jesus Christ. If you see what Christ did, you could never come back at God like that. He's went above and beyond. In fact, there's a, I've had the privilege of um, doing a Philippine Bible study uh, I was asked to do. And um, uh, mostly it's Philippine ladies. Some of them have American husbands. The husbands, they, they'll come and go. Uh, and I believe a lot of them aren't saved, you know. And there's one lady in general, and in, in specifically that uh, she's a Roman Catholic, and she's married to a Muslim man. And every, and you can imagine, so my Bible studies go over really well with her. Um, and as I go through my Bible studies, and they want to know about the history of, of the Jews and their future, if futures Isra- the future of Israel and the glorious future and, and the nations around them that hate them and what God's going to do, then I, I gave it to them straight up what they asked. And she was very upset. 
Super upset about it. Always constant contention. Every time I go there and she walks to the door, man, I just smile. I don't care. You know, they, the, the other people want me there. If she doesn't, that's fine. Um, uh, but she comes in, and it's always a contention. And that's her biggest thing. Wow, what a mean God. What a mean God. Interesting that God is violent. You're married to a Muslim, so I really don't listen too much to that. But the thing is, the biggest ignorant complaint is that that's how God is. And that's just not the case. He expressed his love in Jesus Christ, available to all. God is not sinful. God's not wicked. God's not wrong in recompensing tribulation. It's a righteous thing with God. It's righteous. The Lord takes it personal when the unbeliever troubles you, troubles us. However, the Lord made it clear, obviously, like we said before, that suffering is part of the Christian life. In this, he told the disciples, in the world ye shall have tribulation. And in the world ye shall have tribulation. That's a promise. We love to claim a lot of promises in the Bible. That's one we should claim. Oh, Lord, yeah, in this world I'm going to have tribulation, right? The Lord notices it, though. He does. He notices our tribulation. He sees it. The Lord is well aware of what's going on in our country, in our world. He's well aware that Christians are the enemy. Absolutely. He is well aware of the laws and the regulations that are passed that are directly opposed to what we know to be true and righteous and godly. Okay? He's well aware of the attacks made against the marriage, the home, children, the unborn uh, genders. He knows all that stuff. The problem is we often have it as the problem that we have is that we want to recompense the trouble. We want to be the ones to recompense trouble on them who do these things, these wicked things. However, the problem is our recompense isn't righteous. Only God's recompense is righteous. It's not for us to give recompense to the wicked. God's recompense is righteous. Ours is never righteous. Anytime you want to get somebody back for something, it's never righteous. Never. It never is. And I like all the movies. I like vengeance stuff, man. You did this to me. I'm coming after you and all this nonsense, right? That's all great stuff, but I'm telling you, that's Christian life. Our vengeance is not, our recompense is not righteous. Only God's. We often take it so personal. We take the attack so personal that... Um, which causes us to react accordingly. You know, we take it personally. Therefore, oh man, you attack me, you attack my kids, you attack me. Uh, I'm going to go back at you. See, we take it too personal, and therefore we want to react. We don't realize the attack is on Christ. Sometimes I hold myself in such high esteem, therefore my feelings get easily hurt. I think I'm something special, so when the enemy of the world wants to do something to me, I can get my feelings hurt. And that's just the wrong, the wrong attitude. That's the wrong attitude. Hold themselves in high esteem. Hold Christ in high esteem, and it won't bother you as much. When this world troubles you, mocks you, whatever the trouble comes from from this world, from the enemy, whatever it is, I can tell you what, if you hold Christ in high esteem, it won't bother you as much. Okay? It really won't. But our feelings get hurt because we take ourselves too serious. Hold ourselves in high esteem. It's attack against Christ. They trouble us because we associate ourselves with Christ. We're Christians. But the attack is against Christ. Okay? His recompense is righteous, not ours. It's not, our, it's not for us to recompense the evil. That's, that's up to the Lord. The Lord's the one who does that. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, you remember when Israel asks for a king. They want to have a king, just like all the other nations. And Samuel, the prophet, takes it personal. He takes it as a personal attack. Like, I can't believe it. You know, it wasn't Samuel like the last judge getting towards the end. I'm, I'm taking care of you. What's the problem? Samuel took it personal that they asked for a king. But you know what the Lord said to him? He says, <clears throat> Samuel, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. See, the unbeliever, the unbeliever is rejecting Christ. They reject Christ, not you. They reject Christ. Okay, therefore his recompense is righteous. It's a righteous thing. His merit is justified. Our recompense will not be righteous. Don't we have enough to worry? There's enough things I have to worry about in my own life than to worry about recompensing evil on other people or, or someone does something to me and I have to get them back. Listen, I have so many things I've got to struggle with my own mind, my own heart, my own Christian life. I just don't have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> There's too much going on. We have enough to worry about concerning ourselves than to try to recompense trouble on those who trouble us. 
Okay? It's just not the right way. The Lord's the one. The Lord is the one. His, right, his recompense is righteous. Can I take you to Romans 12? Romans 12. We'll turn a few places here. This way I stay awake. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 17 says this, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Sometimes it's not possible, I understand. But if it, but if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. He's the one that's going to repay. Recompense to no man evil for evil. He says, I will repay, saith the Lord. Because our, recommend, our recompense is not righteous. Our motives for returning evil on those who have committed evil toward us is not righteous. It's going to be done in wrath. It's going to be done in vengeance, right? Avenge not yourselves, okay? Well, you don't understand what this person's done to me. You don't understand what they did to somebody that I love. And listen, I'm not talking about self-defense or defending you. You know what I mean? If someone's, if someone's like kick, stomping you on the ground, you, you can get out of the way, you know, and stuff. I'm not talking about that. But at the same time, uh, stop taking yourself so seriously. It's, again, it's not about you. It's about Christ. They reject him. We have to expect the evil because they've rejected him. He said, if the world hate you, man, don't be surprised about that. How are you surprised? They hated me first, Jesus said. They hated me first. Of course they're going to hate you. Don't be surprised when this comes on us. In Romans, if you look down at verse 21 of the same chapter, Romans 12, it says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Man, do you want to, do you want to recompense for the evil that has been done to you? Overcome it with good. Try doing that. That's so difficult, by the way. When someone does something evil to you, try recompensing it with good. This world troubles you, something at work, whatever it is, man, this is, covers a lot of areas in this world. The enemy who wants to trouble the church, trouble us as Christians, whatever the case may be, man, it's difficult overcoming evil with good because we definitely just want to give it back to them. But overcome evil with good. Um, so difficult to do. Years ago, uh, I, when I, I lived in Las Vegas, uh, 1999 to 2000 in that area, and uh, I was I was waiting. I had I had paperwork in for my wife to come back from the Philippines, so I'm there, and I had to get a job there. And it's the only job I ever had that I was in an office. The only job where I had to like use my brain and my fingers and stuff. So, it, needless to say, it was difficult. So, what made it worse was I had a guy. Uh, his name was Chuck. He was my boss, my direct supervisor, and. I, I, I don't even know how to explain the guy. All I know is um, I never knew who he, I never, you know, one of those guys, you never knew he drank until you seen him sober, okay? Uh, that's the kind of guy he was. Um, drug addict, okay, but still functioning somehow. Um, and let me tell you, I, I later found out, I guess if the drug he was taking was bad and would give him a headache or whatever the case may be, he would flip out on me. I mean, to the point, I mean, he would threaten my life over a piece of paper that I was put in a wrong file. This guy was insane. And, and the Lord was teaching me something. Because I remember at times, man, he'd be like right here in my face, like really upset and screaming. I know, man, I know it's not him. Whatever he is on, that's what he, still, right here yelling. And I'm like, man, I'm just, I'm a very kind of a passive guy, man. There's not, I don't let too much bother me. But in my mind... I was like, there's so much pain I could give you before someone reached you. You know what I mean? Like, that's in my mind. That's my flesh. Like, are you kidding me? You know what I mean? Um, and, but the problem was, this is the difficult thing, I had to keep the job. I had to have the job to prove that I could support, you know, my wife coming to the United States. I couldn't get out of it. I had to stay there, and I had to take it day in and day out, out of control. In fact, Friday afternoons were always the best because when he got completely drunk, at least he was a little bit nicer. He was a little bit nicer. But it came about two years, having that job for about two years, we decided to move to New York. My wife had come. We decided to move to Staten Island. And I remember the last day I was there, he knew I was leaving. Or when I was telling, it was a couple of days, and I told him I was leaving. He found out. 
And he comes up to me and talk about the softest guy <laughs> that I ever met. On the whole night and day, begged me to stay, begged me for, to give more money. He admitted, he says, he says, Paul, he says, ever, so many times when I yelled at you, in my mind, I was like, please don't hit me. Please don't hit me. Like he, he knew he was insane. And, and all that being said, he could never understand. And again, man, I'm not, I'm not tooting my own horn. I had to keep the job because my wife, that's it. Any other time, I'd probably kill him. I had to keep the job. But he says, I don't understand how, how you have a smile on your face and, and, and you're just content and peaceful and, this, and what I put you through. I can't even understand it. And I gave him the reasons, spiritual reasons. But in any case, if he didn't get saved, you know what? The wrath of God still abides on him. It wasn't for me to recompense evil for evil. It would have done him no good if I killed him, okay? It would have done him no good recompensing evil for evil. And if he hasn't gotten saved yet, I don't know if he ever did, um, but the wrath of God will be abiding on him, okay? But Chuck, never, he never rejected me. He rejected Jesus Christ. Therefore, the recompense wasn't for me. Jesus Christ, his recompense is going to be righteous. His recompense is going to be righteous. And I hope and pray that, it, that he did get saved. In Proverbs 20, 22, it says this, say, thou, say not thou, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord and he shall save thee. Are you troubled by this world? Good. That's a good thing. If you're not troubled by this world, there's something wrong. If you're troubled by this world, good. Wait on the Lord. His recompense is righteous. He's going to want to take care of it, okay? Verse number 7, back in uh, 2 Thessalonians. Verse number 7, it says this, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. Recompense is a rest. Recompense. God's recompense is not only righteous, it's a rest. Paul commended the church in verse number 4. He said, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. He says, hey, they had patience. They had faith in their persecutions. Paul says, you have done well and you're doing well. You know, praise the Lord uh, for that. You haven't quit. You've endured all these things. And that's what patience is, endurance without murmuring. That's what patience is, enduring something without murmuring, Okay. But now, Paul says, but now, you who are troubled, rest with us. Take the next step. See, it's one thing to endure persecutions and tribulations. It's another thing to rest in them. That's a whole different story. And people, you could plow through something, push through something, but the next step is rest. We may be able to take a lot of trouble from this world and keep going, pushing through. Glory to God, yes, we should. But in the midst of the insanity, can I really rest? Can I rest? We can often endure uh, our trouble, but it has a tendency to eat away at us from the inside, and we just get no really spiritual rest. Recompense gives us rest. It gives us rest. In Acts chapter 17, uh, we alluded to that before about, about Paul's second missionary journey. The Jews assaulted the house of Jason, okay, for, for him housing them. Uh, they brought him to the rulers of the city because he had the apostle Paul over for dinner and for, for a night. And he, he's threatened to keep the peace, be on good behavior, and they finally let him go home, this guy, okay? And then Paul writes, Paul writes, you know, I bet you that burned in his heart, by the way. I mean, Jason, even though he was used as an instrument for the Apostle Paul to start the church, church of Thessalonica, he's hospitable to bring him in and then gets right, uh, threatened because of it. I'm sure that burned at his heart for a while. And then Paul writes to them in 2 Thessalonians, and I'm sure Jason read it. He says, rest with us. You who are troubled, rest with us. But I can imagine Jason saying, listen, my rights were violated. I was taken out of my house like a criminal. My family was scared for my life or for their lives. And the worst thing is the neighbors are watching. You know, they're always watching, you know, mind your own business, right? How do I rest? How do I rest? The Lord, Paul, the Lord will recompense. Rest with us, Paul says. The Lord's the one who recompenses. If the apostle Paul can rest in the fact, so in that fact, with all that he went through, so should we. We should be able to rest. As wicked as we know that the world is now, and, the, and believe me, all of us, we have conversations and we complain about it, and rightfully so. It's wicked. But at the same time, 
man, we don't have people trying to kill us. We don't have people knocking down our doors yet, okay, and pulling us out. This is what happened to Jason. The Lord will recompense. It's a difficult thing to rest in persecutions and tribulations, is it not? It's a difficult thing to rest. You may push through it, but it's very difficult to just rest in it. In our American Christianity, if somebody looks us at the wrong way, we lose sleep, right? Someone pushes a shopping cart into my car, I lose sleep. I get upset looking for a recompense. I'm supposed to rest. Recompense is supposed to give me, it's supposed to give me rest. In Acts chapter 12, I alluded this to Sunday school. Uh, uh, one Sunday I taught Sunday school. It's such a great event. Um, but Peter is in prison. Herod, Herod kills James, the apostle, and then he puts Peter in prison. And, and it, it was potentially Peter's last day on earth. Okay, he's in that prison, bound between two soldiers, okay? Uh, potentially the next day, he is going to be executed. He's going to be killed. And what's he doing? He's sleeping. <laughs> he's sleeping between two soldiers. Listen, um, he, you know, if I knew I was going to die tomorrow, if, the, if you told me that tomorrow you're going to remove my head from my body, I can tell you what, I'm not getting a good night's sleep tonight. Like, that's just me. I don't know what Peter's thinking. I just, I just can't understand that kind of rest and peace that Peter had. And he's sitting here. He didn't just doze off, by the way. He's sleeping so soundly that an angel comes into the prison and shines a light, and Peter still doesn't wake up. I can see, like, the angel do it maybe a couple times, like, oh, I'm here, you know, all the lights go on, and he doesn't wake up. He finally has to kick Peter, or smote him, kick him, punch him, whatever he did, he smote him. He smote Peter on the side to wake him up. Tell him, man, get up quick. Get up quick. I can tell you what, man, when I read that, I could sure use a dose of the peace that Peter had or experienced in a time of tribulation, in a time of persecution, as little as I go through. You know what? Peter wasn't screaming and yelling at the guards. He wasn't screaming and yelling at the judge that threw him there, the gatekeepers. He wasn't flipping out. You know what? As far as he was concerned, in the end, in the end, there's a recompense. In the end, he wins. In the end, we win, okay? We can rest. We can rest in his recompense. Yes, we are in a war, but it's a spiritual battle against principalities, powers, right? Spiritual wickedness in high places. When it comes to flesh and blood, don't bother wrestling with them. We don't wrestle against them. The people are not the enemy. The spirit behind it, that's the enemy, okay? The spirit of this world, that's the enemy, okay? It's a spiritual battle. Rest with us. No point trying to get back, okay, at them. Rest with us. What helps us to rest? What helps us to actually rest? In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says something here to the church in Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, in verse number 4, Paul says, Great is my boldness of speech towards you, Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. So he's joyful in this. Verse 5. For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. But we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings. Within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not by his coming only but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me so that I rejoiced the more. Notice that the joy, notice that Paul's joy that came in the midst of tribulation was the fellowship of Titus and the spiritual growth of the Corinthian church and their fervent mind towards him, their love. That's what gave him, that's what gave him joy in that tribulation. Without this, okay, without our local body, without this church, without you, listen, I don't stand a chance resting in tribulations and our persecutions, troubles, whatever comes my way. Without you, without this church, I have nothing. There's nothing. I could never rest without this. Outward fightings, inward fears, impossible to rest. Impossible to rest. Paul couldn't rest. He says his flesh had no rest in it. But when it came to his spirit, the only thing that gave him rest was, the, was the, the countenance, the fellowship of Titus, spiritual growth of the Corinthian Christians, their fervent mind towards him. The church gathering is a type of rest, 
Okay, we should be able to come into these doors and rest from the fightings without and the fears within. I mean, that's what brings it. That's what brings it. Without this church, without a place to come to with brothers and sisters in Christ, without this local body, there is no rest. That's the secret to it. Without this, you would just go insane, really. Ultimately, we encourage each other concerning our hope, concerning our secure future, concerning the Lord's recompense on this world. That's what gives us rest. That's why it's not just, I hear these guys, oh, it's just me and God, man, I'm a lone ranger. That's foolish. That's stupid, right? We need each other. We need each other. That's the only way we're going to get rest. Rest with us. The Lord will be the one to handle what is going on. The Lord's going to be the one to handle it. As we said before, he's well aware of what's going on. He'll be the one to handle it. Our recompense gives us rest. If we understand what the Lord's going to do and what he does, it gives us rest, recompense. Look at the, go back to 2 Thessalonians. Look at the last thing here. 2 Thessalonians, and we'll look at the rest of uh, read verse 7. Verse 7 says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So not only recompense, uh, recompense will be revealed from heaven. Not only is it a righteous thing with God, not only is it a rest for us, but it's going to be revealed from heaven. This recompense, this vengeance is going to be revealed from heaven by the Lord Jesus Christ. This reveal is going to take place at his second coming, okay? Unlike his rapture, this will be something that is public when he comes. It'll be public. In Revelations 1, 7, it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. All the kindreds of the earth are going to wail because of him. Wail is loud weeping violent lamentation. When he reveals himself, their unbelief is going to turn into lamentation very quickly. And it says, in flame and fire, in taking vengeance, recompense will be revealed from heaven. It's going to be a horrible time, a horrible experience for those who do not know God and did not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They had a choice to make. They had a choice to make. And the Lord wasn't... uh, um, well, the Lord didn't give, uh, he always gave opportunity. In Ezekiel thirty-three eleven, it says this, Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But that the wicked turn from his ways and live. The Lord doesn't take pleasure in their death. He gives space to repent. He gives opportunity uh, to repent. Bible tells us that the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. I tell you, if it was up to us, if we were in God's place right now, how many government officials would you take out? (laughs) How many things would you change right now if you were in God's place? You wouldn't be slow to anger, right? Plenteous in mercy. None of us would be that way. However, when it comes to our sin, we want him to be that way. We like when he's that way towards us slow to anger in our sin and foolishness. But when it comes to this world, we want him just to take it out. He's slow to anger. He's waited. Of course, we are happy that he's slow to anger with us. However, when he's, be, when he's revealed from heaven, he will recompense. He will take vengeance. His first coming, his first reveal was in peace. It was in peace as a lamb. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. His second coming, his second revealing will be as a lion in wrath and in judgment. And the world is not anticipating his coming. Okay, the world does not believe it. They don't believe that he is coming. In fact, in 1 Peter 3, 2, he, Peter's talking about the scoff, scoffers, uh, those who mock, those who mock. And, and they say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, right, years and years ago, it's been years and years since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. These are scoffers, mockers, mockers, who don't believe that God is coming back. Where is the promise of his coming? Mocking God. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. God is not going to be mocked. In the end, he will come and recompense. His recompense will be revealed from heaven. 
Now, that is a reveal in the second coming. Praise God. The church, us, we're not observing from the earth looking up, by the way. Okay? We are with him at this time coming back. Okay? Praise the Lord. We're not the ones there looking. Unbelievers, they don't obey the gospel of God. They are the ones looking up and seeing them. That's where the wailing comes from. But us as Christians, praise the Lord, we're the ones coming down with them. Don't be deceived by any teaching that the Christian, the church, the body of Christ goes through any part at all of the tribulation. Not at all. That's God's wrath. God's wrath was placed on Jesus Christ on Calvary. If you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, ask him to save you, you're placed in Christ, and the wrath of God does not abide on you. We don't go through any part of that. <clears throat> Well, praise the Lord, we're with him when, we, when he comes back, when he comes back. Um, but Paul's writing, now, this, this passage is sometimes used for that purpose, to try to, to try to deceive people, that we're waiting for that second coming. It's just not the case. But Paul's writing this information to the church to show that his recompense is righteous. He's shown that his recompense, we can rest in it, and it will come when he was revealed. So what is the practical sense? Why is Paul, I mean, he's encouraging them by this, okay? He's encouraging the church of Thessalonica, but how do we, what is the practical sense for us? Because just like you, I mean, uh, you know, the, the second coming isn't supposed to be give, give some like cynical attitude inside, like, oh yeah, I can't wait for people to get theirs. Not at all, not at all. What is this, what are we, how is this supposed to affect us? Okay, well, number one, uh, it should cause us to refrain from the sins that are bringing God's wrath down on this world. Okay, that's one thing. And we won't stay too long on that. Unbelief, whatever it is, we should refrain uh, uh, from those things. Okay? Um, Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. This ought to prompt us to be godly. You want to learn something from the second coming of Jesus Christ? Right? Is... It should prompt us to be godly, to not be part of the sins that he's coming back to pour out his wrath on this earth for. But also, like Paul writes in Galatians 1.16, concerning his salvation, his calling, Paul, he says this, and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. His recompense that will be revealed against those should cause us and prompt us to preach Christ to those who do not know God. That's one thing this does for me in chapter 1 here. Looking at all this, I don't look forward. Just like God doesn't look forward, no pleasure in the death of the wicked, neither should we. There should be no pleasure of his second coming. We can rest in his recompense. We know who troubles us. The Lord takes care of all those things. However, we don't get pleasure in that. What this should prompt us to do is preach the gospel and tell them about Jesus Christ before it's too late. What we're supposed to do is consider the end. In Deuteronomy, a couple places it tells us to do that. Consider the end. Consider the end. Well, consider the end of the wicked, right? Not with just some vengeful thought that you get what you deserved. I told you so. I told you this was going to happen. Not that kind of attitude, but with compassion, with compassion. Wasn't all, weren't all of us at one time on that side, on that side under God's wrath? If we didn't get saved, that's what we'd be looking forward to, a second coming, a recompense of trouble, a recompense of evil, flaming fire and vengeance. That's what, that's what we had to look forward to at one time until someone prayed and told us about Jesus Christ and we got saved. We're supposed to do the same thing. As much as this world troubles us and is an enemy of Christ and his church, we are commanded to preach Jesus uh, to them and pray for them. That's what we're commanded to do. Right? We're commanded to do that, preach the gospel to them, to get them out of this. In Second Timothy, in First Timothy 2, just the context of supplication and prayer, it says this, praying for kings and for the, all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. See that? Praying for kings, praying for those in authority. As difficult as it is, isn't that what it seems like all the evil's coming from, from everyone that's higher up? Again, it's the spirit behind it. They're not the enemy. That's flesh and blood. Pray for them. He's willing, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There's something about that 
final judgment. There's something about destruction. There's something about hell that should prompt us when we see unsaved people. The ones we know, the ones we love, the ones we don't know. There should be something that prompts us to try to get them off that track, right? Try to preach the gospel to them. I was blessed by uh, uh, my daughter. Uh, she, this is probably about a month ago. Uh, she came to me and says, hey dad, I, I think we need to give the gospel to all of our neighbors in our neighborhood. And I said, yeah, of course we do. That's great. I'm, I'm, I'm so embarrassed that I didn't think of that. I said, well, how do you want to go about it? I said, we can go now. We do this. We can do that. I said, I have a great idea. I said, we can start with this. So we got a few hundred tracks. We, I, I ordered a few hundred uh, ultimate questions and some door hangers. And I said, you're going to start going around. I said, I'll be with you and just start hanging these on doors. Let's try to hang, do the, like maybe two or three hundred houses in our area. I'll put the email on so people have a way to get there. You know what, should, what prompted her of that? There was a song that was sung that prompted her of that. It prompted her, and I don't know how the song exactly went, uh, but it had everything to do, man, with, with, with trying to deliver people from destruction, from hell. And, it, and, it, and, it, and whatever she heard affected her heart. She said, man, that's what I want to do. And praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I didn't think of it. My daughter thought of it. Considering what we know to be true and by what we read here, recompense is a righteous thing with God. He's completely justified and merited in recompensing tribulation to those who trouble uh, the church, his body. Right? He paid such a high price to offer salvation freely to anyone, to those who would accept it. However, those who reject it are under condemnation. Our recompense is not righteous, by the way. Our recompense is not. We don't recompense evil for evil. His is. Recompense should give us rest. We are living in wicked times, right? It seems impossible to rest right now. It seems impossible to rest with the crazy times uh, uh, that we're in at this point. Um, But listen, he's still on the throne. He's aware of everything that's going on. Everything that you're going through, any trouble, any tribulation, he's aware of it. He already knows. He already knows. But it says, Paul says, rest with us. Rest with us. We're here to edify and encourage one another. We need this. This is something. And you're here on a Thursday night, so I'm preaching to the choir. But we can't forsake this. You don't want to forsake this. There will be no rest without this. There will be no rest. If the Apostle Paul couldn't do it, we definitely couldn't. And recompense finally would be revealed at his second coming. Praise God, we're with him. We're with him. We're not under his wrath. However, it is a day of destruction from the Almighty, as Joel would say. His revealing to this world should constrain us to tell other people about Jesus Christ. It really should. That should constrain us. So, um, he's got a blessing from this in Second Thessalonians. Hope it was something helpful for you here tonight. I appreciate your attention.